I don't know about you, but it seems like this chain fountain debate is really starting to heat up. Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Electroboom has that in the bag. You know those hundred thousand Canadian pennies they bet? They're his to lose. Yeah, you say that, but what about Steve's test where he laid the beads out flat and the height of the fountain decreased over time even as the beads sped up? You know, I'd like to see Electroboom explain that away. Oh, come on. That test was so obviously flawed. As the fountain moved back, the chain's momentum became more horizontal and less vertical. So of course the height of the fountain shrank. I bet that if Steve had thrown the back end first, then the fountain would have grown. You think so? For sure. Well, if you're so confident, you know, we do have the stuff, so why don't we just try it ourselves? Hmm. Why isn't it working? Well, I think it needs electricity, Ben. Oh. Uh... Well, sh well, let's do this. Wait, weren't you going to throw from the back? Well, I was, but I'm starting from the front as a control. Well, if you're going to do that, then why don't we do like a super control where instead of throwing, we drop it from the front? Yeah, I buy that. Okay, ready? Yeah. Wait. Did the beads just lift up on their own? Yes. Was that supposed to happen? No. What you just witnessed was a dramatic reenactment of the moment that I realized that Steve might be right about the chain fountain. Now, for those of you asking, what is a chain fountain? Who is Steve and what is an electro boom? Pause the video. Go check out the description, there's some links and they should get you all caught up. But back to my realization. Before that fateful experiment, I had agreed with Medi's conclusion that the chain fountain was likely the result of a chain's upward momentum. But in that experiment, I witnessed a fountain develop from a chain with purely horizontal momentum. Something was afoot. Now I had some theories. Maybe the board I was using was not horizontal. But no, a spirit level ruled that out. Perhaps the fountain started at the edge of the board and then moved back to the stationary chain. However, moving to a higher frame rate showed that the fountain originated at the right hand side. And if you lay the chain out in a straight line and pull on it, a small fountain starts at the 90 degree bend, but it does not move backwards and create a larger fountain. Perhaps surface roughness was causing the fountain? But no, running the experiment on a large piece of glass gave the same results. Therefore, I was left with only one conclusion. The chain was being forced upwards by an extra reaction force between the beads and the board. As you can imagine, these results left me devastated. If Mehdi was wrong on this, what else could he be trusted on? Is the resistance of the human eyeball really only 20 kilo ohms? Is it? In the midst of my great anguish, I reverted to my more baser instincts. Despite my best efforts, I fell into a binge, a math binge, and before I could stop myself, I turned out a 50-page paper exploring the physics of the chain fountain. In the light of the next morning, as I looked over my work and despaired over what I had become, I confirmed my earlier conclusion. Steve was indeed right. Let's explore how. You see here a standard chain fountain. The left leg of the chain fountain moves at speed V1, and the right leg moves at speed V2. Looking only at the top end, we see two tension forces, T1 and T2. If we assume that R is small compared to the height of the fountain, we can use conservation of linear momentum to find that T1 plus T2 equals the linear density of the chain, lambda, times V1 plus V2 squared over 2. Similarly, conservation of angular momentum tells us that T1 equals T2, meaning the left side of our first equation reduces to 2 times T1. So, if V1 equals V2, we get that T1 must equal lambda times V1 squared. Turning next to the left leg of the fountain, we see that T1 is equal to the tension necessary to hold up the left leg, given by lambda times L1 times G, plus the tension needed to accelerate the stationary chain up to V1, 
which is given by lambda v1 squared. So, for any fountain height, t1 will be greater than lambda v1 squared. But since our first equation said that t1 needed to be lambda v1 squared, the fountain will shrink until it has zero height and t1 equals lambda v1 squared. This result is confirmed by a MATLAB simulation, which shows a chain fountain collapsing in a manner that closely resembles Medi's test with his flexible chain. Of course, Steve beat me to these equations two months ago, back when I was still on Medi's side, and I had plenty of reasons to dismiss them then. First, if the equation showed that the chain fountain requires a reaction force, how could Steve explain Medi's experiment that showed a chain fountain without one? As it turns out, the equations have an answer for that. In the case of Medi's floor experiments, since there's no gravity on the floor, T1 no longer has to support the weight of the chain, and the fountain can be any height. Then there is the curtain fountain. Now, as we're all aware, the curtain fountain does have to rise against gravity. But because the bottom bend is supported by two tension forces, we find that T1 equals the weight of the left leg plus lambda v1 squared over 4. And since T1 wants to equal lambda v1 squared, the height of the fountain will be 3 quarters v1 squared over g. This conclusion is again supported by MATLAB, which shows that a curtain fountain will develop in the absence of the reaction force that is required in the standard chain fountain. And for those who think that we can ignore the second tension term because the chain is hanging on a smooth rod, you might want to watch Medi's video again, because you can clearly see the chain is being pulled towards the fountain, indicating a high tension force. Now, I had a second reason to believe that Steve's reaction force theory was wrong. The results just didn't seem to make any sense. Let's say that there is a reaction force. Does that mean that the chain is being loaded in compression? That the top beads are sitting on the rest of the chain like a weight on top of a column? You can't load chains like that. And indeed, high-speed footage shows that the beads are stretched out, meaning that they are in tension, not compression. I imagine that several of many supporters had a similar concern. But as it turns out, the equations have a solution for this issue as well. Recall that we just learned that the fountain is stable when t1 is equal to lambda v squared, which for this setup we will say is 100 millinewtons. So, does t1 equal 100 millinewtons? Looking at the portion of vertical chain on the right, we will first assume that there is a 20 millinewton reaction force pushing upwards on the chain. We will also assume that the weight of this length of chain is 5 millinewtons. And lastly, we know that the tension required to accelerate upwards the stationary beads on the cutting board is lambda v squared, which we just said is 100 millinewtons. The first thing we notice is that the reaction force is smaller than the tension needed to accelerate the stationary beads, meaning that even with the reaction force, the chain is everywhere still under tension. However, if we solve for T1, we find that the reaction force makes T1 less than 100 millinewtons, which, as we just said, is the value required to counter the chain's upward momentum, and so the fountain height increases. Therefore, even though the reaction force does not place the chain into compression, by just decreasing the amount of tension in the chain, it contributes to the fountain height. Later, when the fountain has become tall enough that the weight of chain becomes 20 millinewtons, we find that T1 becomes 100 millinewtons, which is the tension needed to cancel the chain's upward momentum, and so the height of the fountain becomes stable. So, to summarize, if not for the tension force, the chain's upward momentum would cause the chain to continue upwards forever, forming a fountain of infinite height. It just so happens that normally, the tension required to counter the chain's momentum is achieved when the fountain has zero height. But since the reaction force decreases the amount of tension in the chain, it forces the fountain to grow until T1 hits its desired value. So we see that this has been a momentum issue all along. Does that mean Medi won the bet? Well, probably not, but might give them something to argue about in their next video. Of course, this does leave out one very important question. Why in the world does the chain rise when it's laid out flat? Now, Steve theorizes that the force in the normal fountain comes from the leverage effect of the chain. But how does the leverage effect produce an upward force if all the action is happening in the horizontal plane? As before, I threw myself into the math, using every equation I could think of to solve this problem. And in the end, I came to one of two possible conclusions. Either A, pi is equal to 3.2, or B, I have no idea what I'm doing.
and considering that I only know like three equations, I think it might be the second option. Don't get me wrong, I have a theory. We know that the chain here is under tension, and I know from my derivation that the chain is also under tension here. And as we can see, the beads in these sections are stretched out. But if you look at these bends, you see that the beads are close together, meaning that these beads have overcome the tension force that should be pulling them apart. The interesting thing about this chain is that the distance between the beads decreases as the bend angle increases. Therefore, there are two opposing forces at work, the tight bend radius that tries to pull the beads together and the tension force that tries to pull the beads apart. And I'm guessing that the chain would like to resolve these opposing forces by opening up the bend radius. One way to do this is by pushing the stationary rows of chain back, as we can see here. But looking through the video, we also notice that the number of these tight bends, on average, appears to decrease as the fountain forms. So perhaps this fountain is the result of the chain attempting to open up its bend radii. Now, I realize this argument is kind of hand wavy, implying that the chain has its own will, strength, and desires, even though we are all aware that grafting those abilities onto chains won't be feasible at the consumer level for at least another 20 years. However, I do have some evidence to back this theory up. First, note that the fountain does not appear to grow as high when the rows are more spaced out, which perhaps allows the chain more room to increase the bend radius without having to resort to any fancy acrobatics. Similarly, I found that the height of the regular chain fountain is heavily influenced by the way it is loaded into its container. When we loaded it in small, overlapping loops, the fountain could often grow taller than 13 inches. But when the chain is loaded in large diameter circles, the fountain never rises above the 5 inch mark, and sometimes it doesn't even form a fountain. The fact that the loading method has such a large impact on fountain height shows that 1. Steve is right and there is a reaction force of some kind behind the chain fountain, and 2. The reaction force might have something to do with the chain trying to open up its bend radius. Anyway, whatever the cause, the math does seem to show that a reaction force is necessary for the chain fountain to form. But I'm sure there are still some out there who are unimpressed by all the derivations and the graphics. After all, if this reaction force is real, why hasn't anyone measured it yet? For that reason, I went out and I bought a scale, I measured its reaction time, and I weighed a bead chain on it, all so that I could measure that reaction force myself. And as it turns out, it was all a big waste of time because the LCD screen on the scale doesn't update nearly fast enough to be useful. I also tried mounting the scale under the horizontal fountain, but it mainly measured the extra rows of chain that were pushed onto it, so no dice. Now, based on my calculations, if you drop the chain from 13 feet, the reaction force would be around 100 millinewtons, which would read as 10 grams on a scale like this. So, if someone bypassed the LCD screen and recorded the weight directly, it probably would be measurable. And if there is anyone out there crazy enough to try that, I have linked the spreadsheet with my coloring scheme below. It should prove useful for your experiment. But without being willing to go through that trouble myself, I guess that leaves us nowhere to go. So, thanks for watching. Okay, so maybe the digital scale didn't work, but what about analog? Remember the footage of the tightly coiled chain? See how the cup is getting all pushed around? If we can observe tin foil getting deflected underneath the horizontal fountain, then we have our reaction force. The results from these tests were mixed. The foil did show some movement, however, it was not the excavator bucket on a trampoline that I was hoping for. But since we are only looking for a force of around 10 grams, this is probably the best we will see on tinfoil. With that said, there were some cool results. The first were the impressions that the chain left on the foil, which were only found in the center third of the foil where the fountain developed, perhaps indicating that the chain was pushing harder in that area. Second, you can see the back of the foil deflect as the bottom of the fountain moves on top of it, again giving evidence of the reaction force. Given tinfoil's lackluster results, I then moved on to cling wrap. The reaction force could be better seen in this example, but also note the relatively small size of the fountain. On the cutting board, the fountain often exceeded the 8 inch mark and had no problem clearing the front edge, but in this case, the fountain does not clear the cookie sheet for most of the run and only reaches the 5 inch mark, even with the end of the tape measure placed below the top of the baking sheet. If the fountain is the result of a normal force, 
It makes sense that it would not reach as high when launching off a stretchy surface. Still not pleased by what I was seeing, I tried floating the cling wrap on a layer of water, thinking it would provide more contrast. And what I ended up with was this. These results were about the best that I could have hoped for. See how the layer of cling wrap gets pushed into the water by the reaction force? Of all the tests so far, this one seemed quite definite, and I was only halfway through. I next took a piece of plywood, cut a hole in the middle, and covered the hole with cling wrap. This let me observe the deflection from the reaction force more clearly. Additionally, since I was not able to tape the cling wrap very tightly to the plywood, the chain really struggled to grow on some runs, adding more evidence that the chain needs a hard surface to push against to form a fountain. Lastly, I created a chain similar to Medi's, consisting of 1 gram fishing weights spaced 1 and a quarter inches apart along 30 feet of fishing wire. This gave it a linear density similar to that of the ball chain, but with a much tighter bend radius. Steve theorized that a chain like this would not form a fountain because the bend radius is small enough that there is no leverage effect. Many agreed that a chain like this would be unlikely to form a fountain, but he thought it was because it tangles with itself too easily. So, who is correct? In this horizontal case, the wire doesn't tangle. Medi's theory would therefore predict that it would create a fountain just as easily as the ball chain, and yet this chain barely rises off the cutting board. And when examining the tinfoil, we see far fewer, and much shallower, impressions compared to the regular ball chain. Both of these results are consistent with the reaction force theory. So, for those of you who wanted to see the reaction force, hopefully you found that convincing. But if you think this is all conclusive, I guess we're just going to have to wait for Medi to get on it and build that digital scale. And by the way, for those who want to examine my high-speed footage in greater detail, I should have all of that posted in a second video soon, so look out for that. And then before we go, a couple of closing thoughts. First, I was pretty excited when I discovered this horizontal fountain. But it turns out it's not a new discovery. Look at this clip from Medi's video. A fountain is clearly forming as he pulls horizontally on the chain. Had he realized what he discovered earlier on, then maybe he could have saved himself 100,000 Canadian pennies. Similarly, when Medi showed that the end of a chain can fall faster than an object in freefall, he unwittingly just demonstrated the chain's leverage property. See, when this end of the chain hits the ground, the ground applies an upward reaction force. And if the chain acts like a lever, then that upward force causes the lever to apply a downward force here, pulling the rest of the chain down faster. Reverse this direction, and you have the mole effect. So again, Medi missed a good opportunity to hold on to his pennies. Lastly, this whole debate really should have ended when Steve pulled out those computer simulations that showed that a chain fountain is impossible without some kind of leverage effect. Of course, I say that now with the benefit of hindsight. But when the video first came out, I was still on Medi's side. I guess that just goes to show the limits of our own rationality sometimes. Finally, I would like to give a big thanks to Engineering After Hours. His video, analysis, and slow motion footage inspired me to make this video. And while we reach different conclusions, his video is definitely worth a watch. I would also like to call out my friends who helped me with this project. Big thanks in particular to Ben, Tanmay, Goose, and to my hippie brother. I couldn't have done this without you guys.